tonight on The Breakdown. Tongan coach Totai Kefu joins us not to talk the ton, but their next challenge, and that's the World Cup qualifier. We attempt the impossible and rewrite World Rugby's eligibility rules. Well, we'll try. And the panel discuss, or should that be debate, the best player to wear the fern that they've played alongside. Kia ora koutou, katoa, talofa, bula, molo e lele. Hello and welcome to The Breakdown. Yes, the Festival of Pacifica Rugby continued on the weekend at Mount Smart Stadium. And after two vastly different contests, we have been left with, well, more questions than answers. We will do our best on The Breakdown tonight to provide some possible solutions. Yes, the team are back together again. JK, you and I were at Mount Smart Stadium, as were you, Mills. Uh, I went to the car park afterwards. It was definitely cold. But I can tell you what, I wasn't sure exactly how I felt about the game, given the results and given the fact, I suppose, it was a difficult night for the Tongan side. I think it was the greatest moment for the awareness of the gap. We should all feel uh, concerned, worried, trying to work out together the solutions, because the highlight for me was the Tongan crowd. They are amazing. I was watching them dance and they were just partying the whole time. It was fantastic. If you were there, it was a great atmosphere. I loved seeing Samoa. I don't think Samoa is as big an issue at the moment. I think they're probably mills ahead for the preparation for World Cup, but we want both teams to make it. But I thought it was a celebration from a crowd and a sad moment for for rugby. And like you say, though, the, the fans, the Tongan fans, were outstanding. Look, the national anthems were amazing. There was so much to like about what was a great day. But, Hannah, this, this confirmed probably what we already knew going in, that one team had a big advantage and another was coming from some very difficult circumstances. Yeah, I think so. Look, but I think we also have to soften the debate a little bit and just realise that we're still deep in COVID times, which affected the Tongans and they couldn't bring their full squad over to New Zealand and also affected the All Blacks because they'll have commercial obligations to play these test matches um, and still have the same restrictions about travelling out of New Zealand that the rest of the New Zealand does. Oh, we shouldn't forget, right, that we were scheduled to play Italy yep. and Fiji, Mills. The fact that all of a sudden we looked for another test match, Samoa felt they weren't in a position to play the All Blacks. They preferred to play um, the Māori All Blacks. So you think about what was... I suppose, created over the course of the last couple of months. It was always going to be a big ask. But for these sides coming out of the weekend, does, does some of them gain something? The three sides, did the All Blacks gain anything out? was a dominant performance. It was a dominant performance on, from the All Blacks. So you've got to be pleased with that. I think, you know, don't worry about... I'm not too worried about the fact it was 100. I think the zero for me was, was really pleasing because so often in these sort of games when, you, when you're playing you, and you're dominant... You know, it's easy to slip off mentally and, and you know, let them in for those extra points. To go on your point, I think you're absolutely right. In terms of the entertainment, if we're looking at it you know, as a positive, the entertainment was outstanding. Yeah, I know it wasn't a full crowd, but what they've done, if you're at the ground, you know, the, the national anthems, the halftime entertainment, the, the Tongans that got right in behind it, that's something that we can actually really go and, and try and grow. You know, can we make this game, into, you know, from, from an entertainment point of view, a lot better so people can go to the game? Is it pricing? Is it things that we do? Is it a concert beforehand? Is it the venue? I think that's a, that, that can be a massive, a, a, a massive sort of tick in terms of, you know, going ahead and looking forward to actually providing it in, in COVID times because it has been COVID, it is COVID, right? So can we grow on that? I think we can. But it still has, to JK's point, though, it's brought up some significant discussions and everyone over the last 48 hours, it appears, since the Test match, Hannah, have had something to say around the fact that maybe things do need to change. Where do those discussions have to start now for you? Yeah, I think so. The eligibility of players, how we can get better players coming back and playing for the second tier nations, not just Pacifica, but all of the second tier nations. I think really important to start thinking about how we can generate some revenue for these guys so that when they do come back, they actually come back into an environment that is fully professional and paid and they can actually do a job in there. Oh, for me, I think like we, we all need to take some responsibility. The French clubs who won't release players, the Japanese Rugby Union, who's got this test eligibility thing where, you know, if you have a test cap, then you can't go there and play. Um, World Rugby, Tonga, Samoan officials over in the islands. Everyone has some responsibility. But it, for me, it's unacceptable. I, mean, I love my football, and I've been watching, you know, the, the European Cup, and it's been amazing. The, the close scores, the, the teams that are competitive. And you can only do that with investment. And 
putting your backyard to one side. So the last time I heard, Mills, you might know a bit more, Scotland and Ireland voted against the eligibility. They voted against things where they were worried about Tonga and Samoa getting stronger. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but I got it from a good source. If we start doing this, our game's never going to grow. If you're worried about Samoa and Tonga coming up and beating Ireland and Wales or whoever, you need to look in your own backyard first and say, we need to do it better. That's what upsets me. And often there's this, oh, it's this person's to blame, that person's to blame. But unless we come together as a rugby community and sort this out so that we're, even the Cook Islands, whatever rugby nation is playing, I mean, who's made the top eight in the last... 25 years. So has World Rugby done their job if Georgia hasn't made it? I mean, Samoa smashed Wales at Carter Farms. When was that? 100 years ago now. They made the, the, the semi-finals and they've gone backwards since. That is an indictment on our game. We need a competitive game. We don't need England playing All Blacks again in the semi-final in 10 years' time. We need Samoa or we need Georgia or Romania or Fiji, or whoever it might be, with the help of World Rugby and some decisions they need to make. But we should forget the fact that over the next couple of weekends, Tonga and Samoa are playing against each other in Rugby World Cup qualifiers, so it's critical for them. Totai Kefu is the man responsible for preparing his side after the weekend. And Totai, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, we look at, well, let's look at where he came from. Look, he's a great wallaby. Cleanly taken by Cobain. All Blacks. There it has been lost forward by the Wallabies in there. Now, Larkham. Kempu! Kempu close! Kempu, yes! Todai Kempu got it. Very tail finish to the great career of John Eels. Can you believe it? And there he is. Totoi, thank you so much for joining us. That was actually a test match I was supposed to play in, but I was in the coach's box and never played for the All Blacks again. And I'm not holding you responsible. Ron Cribb would have been handy if he'd made that tackle. But look, how's your team come through from the weekend? How are you feeling right now? Yeah, we've pulled up all right. Um, you know, this new generation, they get over things pretty quickly. Um, I, I don't know so much about the coach. <laughs> I could have locked myself away for a couple of days, but, um, you know, we move forward um, and everyone's um, getting ready for the next challenge. So, I mean, why was this test match so important to your group going forward and, the fact, the opportunity to, to play the All Blacks? Was it just too good to turn down? Well, I think in the end we didn't have much choice. Um, I think originally we were down to play the Maoris um, and then something happened and we ended up with the All Blacks. So, look, we, we, don't, we don't moan and complain. Uh, we don't get to play tier ones often. Um, and whenever you get the chance, um, you, know, you, you grasp that with uh, two hands. So, um, we, look, we rolled up our sleeves. We had a, we had a good crack. Um, a lot of lessons to be learned. But, um, you know, we're happy it's all finished and we're moving ahead. Kev, would you have played... Like, you finished your career at, what, you were 30, 30, 30, 30-ish? Would you have gone back and played for Tonga? Yeah, if, the IR, if the If WRC had have let you, would you have gone back and given back to the Tongan game? Yeah, I would have, for sure. What do you think the eligibility, eligibility laws, we were talking about that before, trying to get that word out, should be? Look, I think I, I think a three-year or four-year stand down is is fair enough, um, and I think with each case you need to look at it um, differently because um, you know we're talking about Tongans coming back to play for Tonga. Um, in other cases, it's it's, it's very different. Um, but if you know, for people like Charles Puitau, Malachi Fekatoa, I mean, they played Tongan under twenties, so. If, they're, if, if, if they've had a stand-down period of three or four years, I think that's enough. So, Ty, I mean, there's always talk about funding and, and resource and things like that. Would, nowadays, you know, would, would, a, would a bit more money in terms of, uh, you know, bringing that into to Tonga and World Rugby helping out in some way, lure a lot of some of the, your players that are playing over in Europe and, and allow them to come here? Look, it's, it's sometimes it's not always about the money. Um, uh, we we um, we only have really two windows. Um, uh, one of our biggest issues is we got players all over the world. So, 
Um, getting them together is a is a bit of a logistical nightmare. But um, if if I, I think the biggest quick fix for us is getting access to our best players. That's that's the biggest quick fix because you know we've got two windows. Uh, four weeks each, um, so we don't have much time together. We don't have the luxury that um, Japan uh, or, or, or Australia and New Zealand have where they have all their players playing in the one competition. Kev, I've heard stories that like the, uh, the WRC has given money to, to Tonga to try and do high performance, to try and look after the players. I've heard stories that like players are not receiving the money that they should from the last World Cup. I mean... What is going on from an organisational point of view? Do you think that we can change to try and help, like the players and, and you as a coach, be more competitive? Look, I think with with a lot of tier two nations, there's um, a lot of administration and governance issues. Um, there's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of uh, nepotism. Um, so I think uh, if you're trying to install uh, high, uh, high performance programs, you, 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 need a, you need a lot of interference from, from the governing bodies, from world rugby, to help uh, keep those structures as sustainable. Um, obviously, it's a tough start to the season, but um, what, what are some of the positives you're going to take into this week? Yeah, good question. I mean, uh, a lot of the uh, media have asked me that question. I think I think one of the most glaring positives is we we kept thirteen players, um, and certainly out of that bunch, I could see two or three, uh, maybe a few more, go on to have um, you know twenty, thirty test cap, uh, test careers with with Tonga and the Kali Tahi. I could see them playing in the next couple of World Cups. What are you seeing from Samoa? I mean, it'd be fair to say they'd probably have a the better uh, uh, preparation leading into these uh, World Cup qualifiers, and you know, you, you guys won game. What have you What have you seen in terms of their their preparation? Yeah, well, they've. I mean, they've had a they've had a one more game and one more week preparation than us. Um, but you know, we've we've got no excuses. We've had we've had a we've had a game against the All Blacks. We'll have three weeks under our belt. They're in the same vote as us, I think, in terms of getting access to their overseas players. Um, look, they're very strong. They're traditionally still very forward orientated, some very explosive, dynamic backs, very similar to us. So um, they're, they're going to be a tough, tough team to beat, but it's always close between us two uh, nations. You've talked about eligibility, uh, Kef. What would be, if you could vote on the WRC, what would you want for Pacifica Rugby, Samoa, Tonga? Fiji, you've been living it now for a few years. What do you think we all need to do to actually get these proud nations back into the top eight or back into the top four? Look, I, we, we, we have a lot of players that leave our, our island at a young age um, and they, they, they're put in programs, in Wallaby programs, all black programs. We certainly don't begrudge them chasing that 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 pathway. I mean, there's more money for them there, and and essentially, that's why that's 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 what we want. You know, we want we want those players to be able to earn that kind of money to support their families um, back in Tonga. What we want access to is probably the players that uh, are not good enough to to play for the All Blacks or to the Wallabies. Um, those type of players are, could be very beneficial for us and. You know, if we could, if we had access to them, certainly leading up to the World Cup, would be would be a different team. Um, we'd also, we'd also love to get our hands on those players who um, are stuck in that eligibility um, problems and issues. Um, players like Charles Puitau, George Moala, and Co. Uh, we certainly love those players to come back and play for us. Now, we've seen the emotion, you know, after the game. And, but how good was it, you know, you must be proud to, to, to be a Tonga when you see, uh, you know, your fans, you know, with the way they sort of danced the whole, the whole night through, right through until even, you know, while after the, after the game. Was that some of your family members, bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, uh, no, not really. But they're, they're your typical Tongan supporters. We, we love them, you know. They're, cra they're, they're crazy. They, whether we're, we're winning by 50, losing by 50, losing by 100, They'll stay there to the end in the, in the pouring rain to support us. And um, as long as 
it's not about the sport. It, at the end, it's just about representing your country with, with a lot of pride and passion. Not a truer word said. And on that note, we'll end it. Tutai, thank you so much for coming and joining us. I know it was a difficult weekend, but we hope this weekend, I know you'll step up to the plate against Samar. All the very, very best. Thanks a lot, guys. Pleasure. That word, eligibility. Yeah, no, it can get, in, yeah, sorry, it can get all of us, sorry, but I think people. that's the key word we're talking about right now. And, and Hannah, you, you think about you know, some of the, the framework that everyone's talked about three or four years. Um, Sokopi Kipu was on the show. He talked about exactly the same thing. I mean, is it time now when they sit, we're seeing results like that, that this conversation needs to get bigger and wider and countries need to come together and, and start working through how a solution can be found? Yeah, I think so. And, and actually sitting down with World Rugby and finding out what the issues are, because we've been talking about this for a really long time. So um, actually bringing it to the table and having a, an open discussion about how we can all contribute to a better solution. I was just thinking then, and this might be stupid, but central contracting probably doesn't help. You know, because if you are playing for an NRL side and the majority of your money's coming from your club, then you can play for your country. And so maybe there's, we need to look at that central contracting, because what, you know, what, what Kev said is New Zealand have the system that brings players through, and no one begrudges anyone of that and good on them, but, you know, if the majority of money's coming from the national body, you want to stay play for them. But if you actually, you know, born in Tonga and you're getting a lion's share of your money coming from your, your super side, then maybe that changes stuff. Well, uh, Mills, he talked about, you know, we, we spoke to Tutai about the fact that he had about 30 players that approached, but because of their contractual situations, where they are, whether it's playing in New Zealand, whether it's playing in Japan, the moment they become an international player, all of a sudden their contract opportunities going forward change, don't they? So it's all of one of those things in New Zealand, I think you can only have three overseas players, and so that all of a sudden compromises their opportunity to get their next contract. These are these are complicated situations for people who are trying to support their wider family. Oh, absolutely. And we, and we when you talk about that and when you talk about you know the national body not really having that funding to be able to um, allow you to, to, to sort of that stability to, to play for your country and you know somewhere else does well of course you're going to go go down that track you know because you've spoken about it just then Hannah. We've, we've spoken about the eligibility rules for years and years this isn't just you know a 12 month conversation it's been ongoing for for many years but when you're getting paid more to go somewhere else like Japan or to Europe um, than, than what you're getting paid to play for the, uh, your, your national team, you have to consider that. And for, for a lot of these guys, you know, what they're getting from the island nations are, are peanuts. You know? So it's, it becomes an easy decision. And when it jeopardises that contract to come back, of course it's going to be an easy one. You're not going to come back no matter how much you, you want to. These guys want to come back, but they have to support their families. They have to make a living and they have to do it in a short period of time. So why wouldn't you stay over there? OK, but where does, where does the WRC come into it here? Because, for example, Japan, their rule is if you have a test cap for anyone, you're not eligible, basically, or you're going to earn 100 grand less. So a lot of the Tongan and Samoan players go, no thanks because it will cost them, over their career, hundreds of thousands of dollars. How, do we, how, does, how is that allowed? I don't understand how that is allowed, because it's basically so that they can pick, and I've done it, by the way, so, hey, <laughs> I'm guilty, you know, but you, you see the Tongans now going to Japan at 13. You'll see the Tongan community going to the NRL, to Australia, you know, like, we've got to start saying, well, is this sustainable? Is Tongan rugby sustainable if they're all going to play overseas? And if so, we've got to make the best players available. I think it also heightens the importance of Moana Pacifica in, in really getting to the crux of that, right? Because these players do need to be in a 12-month program. They need to, for their development. They need to be getting better um, playing rugby at, a, at the highest level they can. And if there is another option in New Zealand, which is not taking the opportunities away overseas, then we need to start talking about this seriously. And that's the massive opportunity right now, isn't it? The fact that we are waiting, we're waiting with bated breath to see whether or not this franchise is going to get the opportunity to be part of Super Rugby going forward. Let's look at some of the names, some of the former All Blacks that are now playing overseas, which have links back to the island. Here's Tonga, here's some names, familiar names. Augustine Pulu, Charles Piatel, Frank Halai, Malakai Fikatoa, who is going to be eligible on the back of some Sevens um, uh, opportunities that he will 
get around Olympic qualifiers. George Moala, Nauli Lamapi, and the likes of Via Fafita, who's just left the Hurricanes. You see some of those names, Mills, and we know you put three or four or five of those guys into a starting team, significant, significant improvements. Samoa's no different. Oh, absolutely. When you look at these guys, John R. Four is still going, Victor V2, you know? Benson Stanley, you know, he's been out of there for, you know, I, don't know, I think you know, he played a limited amount of test matches for the All Blacks. But these are big names, you know. Uh, I, I, I tend to think, you know, OK, well, there needs to be a capping in terms of what sort of how eligible they can be. But when you certainly put names like, like they have down there, and then another couple from, from uh, the Fijians as well, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's some pretty hearty sort of, I suppose, experience that they can actually share. In oh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Specific. I've just written down the back line. Uh, the number 10 from, sorry, I've forgotten his name, but he was really good on, on the weekend, I thought. Uh, then Moala, Piatau, the brother. Piatau, fullback, Halai on the wing. I mean, some talent, right? And then Solomon Akata. I mean, and that's I mean, what we're talking about. Do you think about. they'd be a little bit more competitive, people? Yeah, but, but, yeah, but I, I absolutely believe it. But it's where do you start, though, Hannah? The fact that I'm an advocate, like, we saw Ma Nonu's name up there, and a lot of people would say, well, why would Ma Nonu want to do that? Well, I look at experience, and I think a lot of times that's what a lot of these teams lose and don't have. Do you want to get a guy who's maybe played four or five test matches? Yes, you'd love to have them. But what about the guy who's played 50 or 60 and come back into the environment? What can they offer, you know, Ma Nonu? 100 test matches, you look at those to go, you know what, for me, a couple of years in an environment, I think it's a game changer in terms of not just being a part of it, but aspirational for other players. Yeah, changing the leadership group, um, professionalism, bringing that level of development to the group. And for the young guys that are going to be in there, that's invaluable. I mean, a, a three-year stand-down, that's what Sokopi Kipu talked about, Mills. I mean, these are all simple things that have been discussed before, but surely, surely when you get results like it in the weekend, that should be the catalyst for change. Well, you think about that. I mean, you're looking at a three-year, uh, you know, stand-down for someone like Kama. I mean, he's really done it, you know. He's gone overseas, you know, for a very long time, and he comes back in. Even if he didn't want to, want to, you know, his, his contribution in terms of um, the experience he's he's um, received from you know his playing days would be massive for the, for uh, for an island nation. So, but this is where we've got to st they've got to start talking. You know, I hope they have, but you know, again, you know, we've been talking about this for a very very for years and years, and we still haven't had a solution, albeit you know through a sevens qualifier, you know, only on an Olympic year. I mean, it's the only that's the only thing we've got gotten out of it. So. Yeah. Hopefully it, can, it starts. Well, I think the conversation needs to continue. World Rugby need to be a part of this because, bottom line, it can't be radio silence. You can't ignore the fact that you haven't invested enough in the islands to see the development that they deserve. The international game, it took centre stage here in New Zealand. Let's take a quick burn around the world. Before we do a quick burn around the world, can we take just a moment to appreciate the true international thing that is aboard JK's head? Thanks. That hat's got a bit of a story. It's yeah, travelled. It's travelled. It's more travelled hats than all of us put got together. Through, uh, came from Sweden, got through MIQ. <laughs> um, I'm having a bad hair day, so I decided to wear my new hat with uh, this you little... You didn't get stung any duty for it, or...? Yeah, no, it's a little bit. He will now. <laughs> <laughs> you look the part. You're all the way from Sweden, it looks amazing. You wear it well. All right, uh, the British and Irish Lions made a statement in their touring match against the other Lions team. They want some strong opposition, though, than what they encountered in Joburg against the uh, Joburg based Lions, trouncing them 56 points to 14. Welsh wing Josh Adams finding the paint four times in the clash at Ellis Park. Uh, look, the red and white's going for it, but there's. No one in the stands. And you know that it's the 16th man normally in the crowd that gets them over the line. And there's just some atmosphere missing, isn't there, majorly? It, it didn't look right, didn't feel right, uh, no noise. I mean, uh, who does this hurt more? Does it hurt the Lions travelling Lions or does it hurt the Springboks if they're not going to have their home fans? Given the fact this is the World Cup, this is the World Champions. Barmy Army. The Barmy Army Alexandra without Park them. was full of camper vans. It was. When they were down here. Yeah. They were a fantastic part of the tour. Does that hurt the Lions or not? Totally. But also, you've got no crowd in South Africa because it's such a hot spot at the moment. So, you know, it's a real state of flux there. No one wins, really. And we've had a taste of that. When we had COVID, we were playing empty stands. No fun. Uh, the Lions building up to their test match at the end of the month. South Africa with a solid warm-up against Georgia. Whopping them, in fact, 40 points to nine. Ireland were seven short, thanks to those on Irish uh, Lions duty. But they still got over the line against Japan in Dublin. 
39 points to 31. The Brave Blossoms were just that brave to the bitter end, clearly buoyed by their match against the Lions last week, where they outscored the touring side in the second half. And JK, you're loving that little chip and run. That was a great try. Chip and chase. Awesome effort. All right, Japan bound. Is the man who can't make up his mind, league or union? It seems like the answer continues to change for Israel Folau. He signed a two-year deal with NTT Communications in the Japanese top league. This after he was trotted out as a new signing for Queensland Southport Tigers just weeks ago. Folau's con that's league, by the way. Folau's contract in Japan is understood to be for two years. Give it a few weeks. We'll see. The old flip-flop might come back. Well, they scored four tries to one, but Argentina just held on for a win against Romania. 24-17, the final score. The Pumas now travel to Cardiff to take on Wales in two tests over the next Off fortnight. Side. I'm loving the threads Off just side. quietly. Quite Who's who? <laughs> <laughs> have, a, have a stab in the dark. Who do you reckon? Well, I'd say the Pumas were the coloured ones. So. That's awesome for Romania. Is, They're a good side, good. mate. But unfortunately, they don't They're have to play side. Scotland. It's been cancelled because of COVID. It would have been nice for them to have gone on and, take, yeah. and played Scotland because I think that would have been huge in terms of maybe picking up another international scalp. Stay on a roll. Yeah, well, the name Umanga is well known in rugby circles. Former AB Tana, probably the most famous. Well, his nephew Jacob, he's making headlines with his debut for England. The Jacob, seven. the son of Samoan international Mike Umanga, and with 12 of the team Focus away for the British well. and Irish Lions, England debuted 12, eight of them started. Umanga played in the centres during the 43-29 win against the US, and that was at Twickenham. And he's not eligible anymore for Samoa. <laughs> well, that's the way it is. Have you got any closer to changing these rules? Maybe, maybe Bill Beaumont's listening, you never know. We've had him live before, haven't we? Let's get him up again. Dave Rennie, uh, he's named his team to play three tests against France beginning Wednesday. A few interesting changes. Uh, Jake Gordon getting the call up at halfback. Waratah's number nine. He's been the best performing halfback in Super Rugby across the ditch and we'll be keeping an eye on that game, of course, with Bledisloe. It's just weeks away. That's going to creep around real quick. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for that, Mills. I'm oh, interested in uh, a number of those guys. Uh, and Michael Hooper being back, I think, is significant for them. They needed some sort of leadership experience. That's a good-looking side. That is a really good-looking side when you when you look at those sort of names. I mean, I, I know they uh, you know, we've dominated the um, trans testament, but when you look at a squad like that, and uh, certainly the guys that, um, you know, they've, they've, they've got the youngsters, the, the, the backs over the number of years, they've been test players now for a couple of years. So, gee, that's, that's pretty good. All right, so up next on the breakdown, we dig deep into the AB's performance. Ton of points, new caps, but was it convincing or are we just a bit too hard to please? I look forward to that chat. But first, it's trivia time. I'm loving this. I am so loving this. Are you ready? JK's ready with the <laughs> JK's defeated already. He's going to pull that hat down. All right, so this is obviously All Blacks related. How many times have the All Blacks put 100 points on a team? in Test Rugby. How many times have the ABs cracked up a ton against opposition in Test? Oh, he's perked up a little bit over there. Yes, he's perked he has. up. He's all of a sudden, yeah, he's got an idea. One, he, he says. Oh, right. All right, okay. so back with their guesses and, of course, the answers right after this on The Breakdown. Back soon. The All Blacks versus Tonga, and this promised to be a great battle, but unfortunately we need to talk about the elephant in the room. The All Blacks were appalling. Couldn't catch, couldn't throw, they were very lucky. They could have easily have lost if it wasn't for the 102 points they scored. And for Superman Will Jordan, five tries, thank you very much. But it was another fictional character the commentators kept comparing him to. Will Jordan, licensed to Rome. Oh. Licensed to Rome. Jordan, licensed to Rome. Will Jordan, license to Rome. They would have to be the lamest secret agent going. Who's the guy in the black tie? Have the All Blacks got a butler now? I think the All Blacks have got a butler now. Come on, boys, keep up your fluids. Sit down on some of this power right now. Good shot. What, what? That's how butlers talk, right? Oh, I knew well, it was eventually oh, coming. You. Love it. always going to get me eventually. Love it. All right, you would like me to segue away from that? Take the heat off. All right, um, trivia time. I'm on oh, strike. <laughs> of course you are. I'm on strike for this one. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, because uh, there was an all-black test where we won by 100 and it wasn't... Was it wasn't counted. Oh, so the question, for those people at home who might have missed it, the question is, how many times have the All Blacks put 100 points on the opposition during a test match? Test match being the key word. What have we got, JK? You're Best on strike guess. or you off strike? Best guess. Six. Six? Hannah? Five. Millsy? Four. 
Oh, I've written down four, but I'm tempted to say five. How many syllables does eligibility have? <laughs> I don't want to count them. I can't, so can't don't ask it. me. JK, you're in the Is money. Is that six? Yeah! Check that out. Read and wow. wait. And you can add one of those, which is an unofficial test. 1987, All Blacks versus Japan was not a test. Let's look at all those. There, okay, Samoa. Uh, yeah, I knew that, that was. Uh, Mills, knew... Mills, what did you say? Four. Yeah. I oh, Tonga twice. Tonga twice. twice. Japan. I didn't get Portugal. I, Portugal. I didn't get Portugal. I guessed, Portugal. by the way. <laughs> I didn't get Italy or Samoa. So I guessed. I didn't get Portugal. Great stuff, JK. Must be oh, well done, mate. That is, that's the Thank first you. time this year. That's outstanding. Thank you. That's give us another dance. Yeah, just, that's dance, what you call mate. pulling it out of your hat, because that's exactly what that is. All right, let's talk about the test match on the weekend, because we have to talk about the All Blacks. It was the first test of the year, the Steinlager series. They've got Fiji over the next two weekends, Dunedin and then Hamilton. OK, um, what, what do we take away from this test match? Uh, JK, what, oh, what you I saw, thought, what did you like? Yeah. I liked a lot. I thought that um, the hardest thing in a game like that is actually sticking to your game plan, executing correctly. I think they had a poor 15 minutes in the first half. Started incredibly well, then they went off the ball, but the second half I thought they were really consistent. Uh, got some new guys out there. I liked Popo Ali'i. I thought he was strong early when, when, um, when the ball was being thrown around a bit. So I, th I thought there were some real positives. I think what, what else could you take out than than that, there wasn't anything. Maybe combinations. Mills, did you like uh, did you like Reeks at centre? What did you think of? I, I thought he was impressive. I thought he'd done everything that he needed to do because sometimes in these sort of games you blow out and, and, and try something a little bit different. I think in terms of the combination himself and Quinton Pye had, uh, Quinton Pye for me real, was really impressive in terms of his first game, his organisation. Um, he looked a different player, like a step up. From, from Super Rugby, um, getting in behind those those pods, you know, with the, with the forwards, but the way he sort of the money, even that sort of stuff, you know, because you've got to get a feel feel about sort of the line speed as well, particularly when you've you, you, um, the scores blown out a bit. But the other sort of thing I was really impressed about too, and it was right across the board, was their decision making in terms of the, the offloads. Um, so they were winning contact, uh, guys were getting in behind, uh, the offload game was, was moving. OK, if you're going to pick it apart, there's, there's probably only one thing. OK, there were a, a couple of things that the, the All Black coaches will look at. And they'll, you know, teams like South Africa and Argentina, in terms of the, you know, Tonga had a, had a go at the line out, they'll be a lot better than that. So they haven't been put under pressure yet, but I think that's zero um, in terms of not letting that, those tries in. That's a big positive for the, for the All Black pack. And what did you like, Ken? Yeah, the ability to keep width, as JK was saying, just holding structure is really difficult in those games. But um, obviously, uh, the wingers and also the loose forwards that we saw roaming out, keeping width for them. Um, their ability to, um, when they broke the line, to have numerous support runners. And that was massive on all of their tries. They had options all across the park. Um, was really impressive. Now let's have a look at it because you're 100% right, Hannah. The fact, the ability, and maybe this is a change tactically. All of a sudden, we saw loose forwards last man, JK. So on the outside of the wings, and our, our ability out there, Akira Ioane, Dalton Popoli'i, uh, Luke Jacobson, all really good athletes and not getting left behind. Will Jordan pulls up and waiting for support. But does it create, I suppose, a different d a type of support play? Yeah, when I saw it happen, I thought that's interesting because they possibly could get left behind for pace. But when you when you analyse it, if you're defending against it out wide, so the opposition centre wing, how they're going to defend it is often quite difficult because if the wing has to drift off, you've got some pace on the inside, drifting off to the loose forward, I mean. And then, um, no disrespect to, to us wingers out wide, but if the winger does hang on to it, you've got a better clean out, better set up, quicker ball. I noticed that it might have been the opposition, but I did notice that the ball, when it did get set up out wide, was, was quick when the wingers took it in. So I, I thought it was a, a good initiative. I don't know whether I'll stick with it, but... Well, I'll be surprised if they don't continue to use it. I'm surprised if you bring something in just for a one-off performance and you're not looking at how it goes, whether or not you'll keep the build on it. I, I really liked it. The other thing we always talk about is who is going to be the starting 10, who is going to be at fullback. I really did like, Hannah, the way Damien McKenzie's role in the game. It changed quite often. He played, I suppose, a lot for me at 10. He stepped forward and became a key decision-maker. Did a lot of it for the Chiefs. Did you like what you saw from him? And does he continue to own the 15 jersey? Yeah, the dual, the dual pivot or the dual playmaker. I really liked it too, actually. And not only at 10, but also slipping outside 10, um, seeing space wide, using his long passing game. Um, I think w with who they've got, with Moanga, Barrett and McKenzie, 
um, it's pretty exciting that they can have three of those players slot in into that dual pivot role across the field. The thing I love about DMAC at, at 10 is he actually plays like a league standoff. Um, and he started doing that for the Chiefs, so he actually goes to the line, but often he'll go lateral with guys coming off on the inside, so he's creating different angles, and that's what I like about it. If you talk to me about two pivots and they come up and do the same stuff, so I know he can bring the kicking game, but I love it when he goes to the line on the angle, but like rugby league, and he's got options on the inside, on the outside, a cut, and I think that's really something we could build on, especially if we're over the advantage line, maybe the other 10s involved, whoever it is, other, in a ruck or something. I, I just like it as a variation to our game. Mills, do you see those significant changes uh, for the first test in Dunedin uh, against Fiji? A lot of really good players who are available for selection who didn't play on the weekend. Yeah, there are a lot of good players. Oh, I think they will make a, f um, a few. I mean, what was pleasing in the weekend is, you know, they've got some deputants out there, uh, you know, so they, they got a taste of what Test Match Footy was, was all about, you know, and it's a great way for them to start. So, But it's more your other guys now coming back into it, you know, a guy like a Retallick, um, you know, to, to Bolutu, does he, get a, does he get a start? I mean, you know, who, who starts in the locking department to, to lock with, with the captain? The Lucy is always going to be an ongoing conversation. And then you come back to, you know, where David Harvey Lee sits in there. So what, what this has created is, um, particularly this game, is, is there's now going to be onus on competition. Um, so I, I think they will. I think they would have had in mind who they're going to you know, go out there and perhaps that third game would be you know, you know, their, their, their best team. But um, in terms of what they've, they've, the way they've started, it's a pretty positive start for the All Blacks. Yeah, I think also if they keep the same structure, are we going to see the same structure be rolled out with those different players or are we going to see a different structure that they could use against another team coming up in Australia and Argentina or South Africa? And then, as well, Aaron Smith added to the mix. Look, I was really impressed with Finlay Christie. I thought showed great energy off the bench. But it's a different challenge going forward. Fiji will be better again in the course heading towards the Rugby Championship. Yeah, look, I think the greatest thing, probably the greatest thing that we didn't mention before that happened on Saturday night was internal competition. One of the greatest all-black teams you'll ever play in is when you've got someone that is actually ready to take your position. So I think, like Mills mentioned, that that's now on. You know, all those young guys came on, they'll be... Sniffing to have a crack, they've got all the energy at training, they want to have another go at it, you know, and you've got some pressure on, and that's great. And there's something to be said for confidence. I certainly believe that if you can believe in the game plan that you're running, all of a sudden your ability to execute, make faster decisions, like Mills talked about, absolutely critical. Yes, there are plenty of highlights here at Mount Smart Stadium, but our club came, it continues to thrive, Burn, and we've got a couple of great tries oh, from around the country. We do every week. We're right from the big dance from the men in black to the coloured hoops of club rugby. We love it. It's not just international teams that get close to cracking the tonne. Monaco Rovers, on their 125th Jubilee match against oh. University, lost 99-7. to But the try they did snaffle by John Palisasa was an absolute pearler. It was 45-0 at one stage. Uh, that try bringing the halftime score to 52-7. And on the East Coast, Uawa played Tokararangi. We last saw uh, a score posted at 21-26. We hope that's the final score. That was Tarangi. Uh, halfback Sam Parks with some of the glory. And thanks to our friends at Grassroots Rugby for the footage. Can you update us on the score, 21-26? If you didn't see another that? post. If you didn't see another post, there's a chance they lost. <laughs> <laughs> we got all look very exciting and no one updated. And here's one for you, Mills. Our former All Black, Mosei Tuili'i. He's back playing a year old club suburbs can you believe it at the ripe old age of 40 there's hope for well some of us yet not all of us some of us how hey, good damn silly oh Jeff. millsy has it, got, has it got your number no, that, my back's starting to ache just looking at it. <laughs> oh. It was like JK's call from the weekend, reaching oh, for an ice pack, just looking at some exactly. of those hits. had the privilege of representing our country, and that's where we're going to finish the show tonight, talking about that pathway that we took, who inspired us, and who were some of the favourite players and great players we played with. And JK, let's start with, with you. Was there an all-black or a such, rugby player? It's a it's hard one to do. It's such a hard question. But to inspire, that inspired, inspired you to be, to be the best that you can be. That one's easy. That's an easy question. Uh, Brian Williams, uh, Sir Brian Williams. I can remember right in my, in my head right now of him sidestepping in goal in South Africa. Unbelievable. It was like a nine-foot sidestep. And I've got that printed on my brain, and I said, I want to do that. So why is mine the same as yours? No way. Yeah, because I, that was what I grew up with, the stories of... Brian Williams in South Africa and then seeing the footage of it, my dad talked about how great a player he was and the sidestep and, you know, 
if I, I remember going out and learning how to sidestep, it was trying to sidestep like him. Mm. You know, the big wind up and step and bam, he was gone. And, he actually you know, missed the step. I went and studied with him. Yeah, yeah, because he, yeah, he missed so the step. He missed the step. So hop. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and then I, got, I was lucky enough to play with a Christian Cullen. And, mm. But there was someone as well. Uh, a Serge Blanco was one that oh, I loved yeah. watch playing for France. You know, there was a, f a freedom about it, you know. And of course, watching yourself, JK, I wasn't going to isolate you yeah. entirely here, but seeing what you were able to do through the 80s, that was, that was it for me. I'm looking at it going, you know what, I want to be like them, Hannah. Who was it for you? Yeah, so we didn't really have the history of, of watching, um, I suppose, our heroes on TV, but it was when I turned up in Dunedin and uh, Anlia Rush, older sister of Xavier Rush, was down there, and every week, Every time before training, she was there for an hour before and an hour afterwards. And it was really that that she uh, put, took me under her wing and, and taught me what it was to be a professional, not in monetary terms, but a professional with attitude and, and what it really meant to play for the black jersey. For you, Mills? Oh, I think, yeah, similar to you guys. I think you guys were pretty inspirational too, and, but it wasn't really until I was sort of Form 2, what's that, year, year 10, when uh, I got a visit from Vainga Tungamala on his book tour down in Invercargill uh, and seeing a real All Black in, in front of me. And I suppose uh, from a, uh, a Samoan born in, in the islands and living in Invercargill and seeing that those guys there and doing what they do on, on the rugby field, the likes of Michael Jones, Ronnie Clark, um, you know, I, I suppose it's something that sort of resonated in me then that I thought, oh, far out, these, that's pretty wicked that these Pacific Islander guys can actually go out there and, and be all black. So I suppose that was really um, inspirational for me and probably the first time that, that actually sort of honed in that, um, you know, these guys are, you know, pretty, pretty special. I'd like to say it was a privilege playing against Stinger. But it was quite frightening as well. <laughs> I did that my first couple of years. I would yeah. never call it a privilege. But it was great. I went on tour. Broke my thumb. First tour was with Inga, and he was amazing. You yeah. need those people. And so then you think about when you're playing JK, who was it? Who were the best? Who was the best you played with? Yeah, that's really, really hard because you play with 15 of the best. Um, so when, when we're talking about it, I, I think people who transform the game when you're there. So mentioned to Fitzy, you know, first ever hooker that was out wide running. But I, I really think Michael Jones. I mean, I used to sit back and watch him. Like, he was just the most amazing. I named my, my son after him, Nico. Um, because on the field, I didn't have to even look for him. I just know he was going to be there. I remember going through a gap in the World Cup and I was going as fast as I could, as fast as I could run. We're playing Fiji, and I turned, and he was smiling next to me. <laughs> I gave him the ball. You know, he just like had this, had this amazing um, style of running. And I was there when he did his knee as well. Yeah. But he came back and transformed himself. So I think you know he was pretty transformational. For you, Hannah. Um, oh, this is a hard one for me too. Actually, is the likes of Anna Richards, who was the best at running the women's game that I ever played with. Um, leadership, Farah Palmer, but it was a lady called Rochelle Martin, who was a gutsy flanker who played above her weight every single game and changed games that she played in was wow. the greatest. For you, Mills? Well, I, I think, you know, I was, I was very fortunate to be able to play in you know, the Macquar and, and Carter era, so it's very, it's, it's a tough one. If, I, if I've had sort of that, you mean, I mean, those two could easily go down as the greatest, you know, ever to play the game, but, you know, a, a third person that really inspired me um, was probably Ma. You know, the fact that he's gone on to play 100 and so many games. And still going. But the adversity that he had to go through and to change the style of the, you know, the person he was uh, in, a, in, a, in a, and out of the uh, environment and to get to that level, I, you know, um, I think in terms of, of, terms of that, um, you know, he's right up there. But I, I don't know if I can pick a... You can never narrow it down to no. one, can you? It's too hard. Never can. It's you talk tough. about people really? influence hard. me. When I first started, it was David Ladder. For the very point, you, the fact that he put himself through hell every week to get out there, undersized, undermatched, but every week he was there working his butt off. But for me, and you mentioned another one, um, Fitzy, you know, I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to play with him. I mean, one of our greatest ever leaders. And then Zin Zan. Because oh, there was yeah. nothing Zin he couldn't do in a rugby field. And he'd always tell you about it. Yeah. And he'd do it. And he never doubted himself. And he just had a talent. Just just an absolute talent. They're a special, it's a special group, and when you look back, we're very, very fortunate to be a part of it. Where are we fortunate to be this weekend, team? What are we doing? We yeah. are doing Dunedin. Bring your thermals. Thermals. Might be a little bit chilly down in Dunedin, but the All Blacks, they are back in action once again. Plenty for us to look forward to. The team will be back next week. We can't wait to talk about another All Black test. We'll see you in seven days. This hat's thermal. <laughs>
Arizona. Busting through his top elite. He's away. Yeah, Bridge in space. George Bridge. He's got Wimmer with him. And the All Blacks are on again. Space out wide. McKenzie. And Jordan goes in. Yeah, steaming onto it as Bridge. He's been the provider tonight. McKenzie. Nice. Oh, Wimmer. That's lovely. Rushing through the tackle for Nugget. Getting a nice ball away. Jack Christie. Blackout is there in support. Puts a lovely ball away to Johnny Barrett. McKenzie is going in for a bunch of fives. Away to McKenzie. Numbers away to the left. Oh, he's going to get one. Finally, with the last play of the game, George Bridge gets a deserved try. And it's 100 up for the All Blacks.